This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher, and today we're diving into our first official episode of the PR Podcast by welcoming someone who I have looked up to for a very long time and called a friend for a lot of years, my good friend and buddy, Steve Hawili. He's the founder and president of Word Hampton PR based on the east end of Long Island. Steve, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Jody. It's an honor to be here. It's great to uh, be with you. And... uh... You know, it's uh, always a pleasure to speak to another professional such as yourself. Thanks, man. Uh, you know, we, we ran into each other, I guess, first over social media, right? That's you correct. Are, and, and you were one of the early adopters of social media in public relations, at least in this region, on Long Island, New York City area. Um, and, and, and you were something, someone who I looked up to as being able to use and manipulate, and I mean that in a positive way, social media. Um, to your client's benefit. Um, Tell me a little bit about sort of how you got Word Hampton started and then how you got into social media. That might be a long road, but you take it. (laughs) (laughs) We don't have all that time, Jody. Uh, uh, Well, briefly on the PR front, um, you know, I have a unique story. I had never worked in an agency and I never studied in college. uh, So I was very much of a self-starter. I had... um, um, was uh, working and living in uh, Manhattan at the time. This is this is going back into uh, probably almost 30 years ago, and uh, I uh, found that I had a gift for copywriting. So I uh, uh, created a little direct mail piece for restaurants, uh, mainly because I was trying to get some uh, uh, new bar customers into a a, a place where I was behind the stick. And um, I had no money at the time. And I, I asked the owner, I said, listen, listen, I've, I've got this this list of former bar customers. And I also, uh, somebody gave me the list of Saatchi and Saatchi, which was located over on Hudson Street. This was in downtown Manhattan. And um, I said, would, would you, could you front me the postage or pay for the postage for this? I said, I want to let people know where I am. And uh, he says, hey, this, this is great. Um, you know, I've got the mailing list for the Greenwich Village Chamber of Commerce and for the Soho Chamber of Commerce, and thus a very uh, a nascent direct mail um, company was started, but I wouldn't say company, um, but I would go around to restaurants um, below Houston, above Canal, and west of Broadway, a very defined area, and um, say, hey, listen, you know, I, I can put fannies into these seats i think um with these letters um and people began to buy them i had no idea what to charge so i was really giving it away but i loved it i loved being paid for my writing and then that same restaurant where i was working uh asked me if i had written a press release and i was just so um such a greenhorn i said well what's a press release and uh i said show me one i'm sure i can do it so i Guy showed me a release and I and I wrote it and I got a hit in New York Newsday. It was for a five dollar lunch for a restaurant called the Red Caddy on Houston Street. It's no longer there. And um, uh, a little light bulb went off. I said, oh, my gosh, that's so powerful. That's what I want to do. So I actually had a PR firm before I even knew what PR was. I just barely learned what a press release was and I ran with it. And then shortly thereafter, um, I ended up making a move with my new bride at the time, um, to uh, uh, move out to the Hamptons, and I had gotten a job at Nick and Tony's, which originally I thought was a spaghetti joint, and then I learned that it was sort of one of the um, preeminent power restaurants on Long Island, um, let alone uh, in the New York area. And uh, so I actually started the the business from behind the bar because, as fate would have it, the New York media went would always come, or many of them still to this day, those same people. Uh, go out to the the Hamptons in the summer. So I got to meet Florence Fabricant, develop a relationship with her, Gail Green, uh, some, uh, you know, iconic chefs like Pierre Freyny. um, I met Craig Claiborne, um, and then the writers from New York Magazine. um, And um, 
And then at that time, it, I, I guess I must have, I'm not sure how I found out about Newsday or Newsday found out about me or the Long Island section of the Times, um, but I very quickly somehow connected with them and um, a PR firm was born um, almost 30 years later. We're known for hospitality on Long Island. We have clients in New York. We actually started another division called Metro Restaurant Marketing. Uh, we have done restaurants in the Maryland area, up uh, a bed and breakfast that also had a restaurant, um, or rather an inn in Camden, Maine. Um, uh, we've opened uh, a Basito in West Hartford, a, um, um, a restaurant called Balo at uh, Mohegan Sun for the John John Tunney and his group out of uh, at a, a Basito in Huntington. So um, it's been a great ride, and of course. We adapted uh, along the way, and uh, you mentioned social media. Uh, this was uh, so foreign to me in, let's say, 2005, 2006, really was when Facebook started. Um, and uh, I, I went to a, um, a seminar uh, for a lot of PR professionals, and um, uh, a guy from um, uh, Edelman spoke. Uh, in fact, it's uh, Steve Rubell, who is just the, you know him, he oh, is yeah. really, he's, a guy. he's a, not only a great guy, but he is the, 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 the forerunner. He is the, um, uh, the, the thought leader when it comes to social media and its applications, certainly for PR firms. So, uh, but what, what he was saying to me was, and to all of us, was just pure Greek. But um, we ended up uh, learning as much as we could. And then, uh, you know, there was the application of it and bringing, you know, bringing clients in, which was a whole nother story. So that, that's a great roundup of sort of and, and really does not even do justice to <laughs> where you've been in the last 30 years. But something that jumped out at me there was sort of the, the similarity between um, how you got started before you even knew what public relations was and how you began to dip a toe into social as well. And, and sort of the theme of always trying something new, always pushing a little bit of the envelope, going somewhere where maybe you don't necessarily have a comfort level, uh, but for your own maybe uh, assurance in yourself that, okay, I'm gonna figure this out and make it work. Has that been your approach historically? Yes, and I think I've been uh, blessed with uh... Uh, good instincts and a uh, good gut. And I've learned to trust my gut. And what I saw with Facebook was that this was uh, a communications medium that had enormous implications for restaurants and um, opportunities for restaurants. And um, my team was is always younger than me. Uh, I, I, I went to a, uh, I ended up uh, working with a consultant fr out of uh, Sedona. And um, I, we had, we had, a bunch of us had gone um, to one of his workshops and the conversation turned to Facebook and how I, I, I and then just parenthetically, I think as a, as a firm owner or as a publicist, we always need to look ahead, look out over the ocean, if you will, and see if there are waves that are coming, as if we're surfers, right? That's what the surfers do. What are the swells? What's coming in? I was wait. I was waiting for the water analogy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love water. My we'll get goodness. into that later. <laughs> and folks, just so you know, Jody and I uh, share a love for the southern Maine coast, and um, we were talking before we went on the air. We're both going to be up there within three weeks of each other, and we do it every summer, and we, we absolutely love it. We both go to the same place. I think it's time to shamelessly plug uh, Bob's Clam Hut, which yes. we do not work for. We just love the place, and you can't get better fried clams. And, uh, my God, their lobster roll is crazy, and it's just a machine. Um, so you got to get the T-shirt, right, Jody? Um, but I'm uh, update mine this year. Mine's getting a little raggedy. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, it, So – I came back from uh, Arizona and I said to my team, I said, listen, I want everybody to get 
a LinkedIn page. I want everybody to get a Facebook page and I want everybody to get a MySpace page. Well, some of them already have, <laughs> right? But here's what Rebel said. Here's what Steve Rebel said. And I never forgot this. He says, you know, there is a woman, a, a young woman in her mid 20s named Sally. And Sally had something like 770,000 followers on MySpace. And, you know, we're, we're kind of going, yeah, where are you going with this? He says, well, ladies and gentlemen, that makes her the fourth largest media entity in the United States after whatever the numbers were, Wall Street Journal, uh, USA Today, New York Times, LA, LA Times, and then it was Susie, right? Or Sally. <laughs> Sally, right. And I was just, uh-huh. And so he says, and so then the smart folks at Procter & Gamble reached out to her and said, hey, by the way, what kind of, what kind of soap do you use? Oh, you use, because remember, my, the MySpace setup was, These are my, this is my favorite soap, this is my favorite whatever. So that's how, um, that's where the little light bulb went off for me, but I sh still didn't know what to do with it, but I filed that. I filed that because I think that seminar was in uh, either early 2006 or early 2005, right? This is what Sally was the original influencer. Yes, right? There you go. Right. Uh, good, good point. So, um Anyway, my team looked at me like I had, uh, I had three heads, but um, that's where, as a leader, uh, a PR manager, uh, if you if you have an instinct about something, we had to dr first of all we had to get the employee buy-in, right? And then once we did, then we were able to um, at least discuss this, pitch this with our clients. So we were offering our clients Facebook pages. In by January of 2008, which was pretty early in the game. Looking back at that, you know, could you have even predicted how big social media was going to get? I mean, I remember getting into that. I remember when I first went on Facebook, um, it was strictly for it was still strictly for colleges. Um, right. And I was working at St. John's University. And so I had a dot edu email and I needed to go on there to monitor what the students were doing right. <laughs> and to see what was going on and maybe any mischief that might be going on online. Right. Um, I, I don't think any of us could have predicted how big um, social media, Facebook, and all the others that we didn't even know, didn't even exist back then, would have become, um, and how influential they would be in the business that, that we practice of, of public relations and getting people's word out, and especially in the restaurant business where you work. Right, you're, you're absolutely right, and it's funny because um, we now, uh, so first, uh, we had to convince, um, you know, the the vast majority of our clientele that uh, they should be on there, and that they should pay us to be on to help us manage their sites. So there was that sell, and now um, it's about um, convincing the client as to the power of Facebook and the power of Instagram in terms of its worldwide um, uh, uh, girth, if you will, but also how to use the back end. In other words, how to, uh, uh, you need to really need to boost posts. And if this is one takeaway for anybody that's just getting into the business or maybe has been into the business for a long time, um, the way that Facebook works is algorithms, man, you really have to put a little bit of budget into posts so that people read them because basically, as we understand it, and by the way, as you know, Facebook changes like every three weeks. I swear to God. And there's not, and there's not like, it's not like NBC covers it or like Newsday covers it. You happen to open up Facebook one day, and or there'll be some message in your box saying, "And this is how they just did business pages." Say, "Oh, by the way, there's now business pages." That was that was 2010, right? It's like, oh, uh, okay. And so I remember that when that happened in the office, right? Somebody would go. Uh, hey, did you see this thing about business pages on Facebook? And somebody else said, uh, yeah, I thought I saw something like that this morning. Steve, have you seen it? I go, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. And so basically within about four or five days, we go, okay, so there are business pages, you know, it's so weird. Um, but, but the point of it is, is that it's still a great buy 
you know, if you even just commit like 200 bucks a month so that you're sponsoring, you know, X amount of posts and putting, I don't know, five bucks behind the post, because the important the thing here is it's to, to you've got all these people that like the page. Well, if you don't boost the post, they're not going to see the the information. And then the other thing is you can't necessarily sell, sell, sell on Facebook because otherwise they'd call it um, um, uh, they wouldn't call it social media. They'd call it advertising media. So you've still right. got to find this balance to be, 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 be not being. Uh, hammering people over the head. So, um, yeah, you know. I think that's a huge misconception even now. I mean, and, and maybe, you know, we're neck deep in it, but yeah. people still, I think a lot of people and a lot of clients, I think still think that you can go viral on name your social media platform without spending, like you said, just that little bit of money to put behind it. Um, the, the, the organic traction is just almost nil, I think on Facebook. Yeah, correct. Um, you know, and and anyone who's been on Facebook recently or the last you know few years knows that if they have you know a hundred friends, they see ten of them. Yep. Right. And the information from ten, and that's just you and your friends. Right. So put that in the context of a business that needs to get out to however many hundreds or thousands of people. You absolutely have to come in with one a smart strategy to a bit of budget behind it to make sure that it's getting to the people and it's targeting the people that that you uh, you want to get to. That's correct. And it's uh, um, there's a little bit of a science behind it. And then the other thing is, is that you just can't. Um, this is a little bit of a pet peeve. You just can't keep saying, hey, come on down. It's wind down Wednesday. Because eventually people go, okay, you, you, you're not telling me anything new. That's why you've got to get it, be a little bit creative in your post or a lot creative and, and make sure that you've got some imagery in there and good imagery. So uh, yeah, it's a whole nother subject, you know? Absolutely. Other- yeah. And, and, the vi- and the video works really well too, I find, right? Correct. I mean, Correct. anything that's authentic and engaging and sort of carries the voice of Whatever the place is, whether it's a pizza joint or whether it's a, you know, a, a, a shelter and you want to adopt dogs or whatever that is, right. um, it's got to be real. It's got to be genuine. Got to be authentic. Um, let's take that analogy about the social media and pivot back to traditional media. You sure. mentioned, you know, you were doing some call outs before New York Newsday um, <laughs> back in the day. Right. And, and and all those sort of reporters and publications that you need to know. Um, And I frequently use, uh, here comes the water analogy with clients, fish where the fish are, right? Fish where your fish are. Yep. Um, I I, I warn clients against the phrase, we got to be everywhere. You don't need to be everywhere. You need to be the places you need to be. What's your approach with clients when um, you're counseling them on traditional media um, and sort of making sure that they're in the place that's going to drive their, that's going to move their needle? Well, They all want it. Um, We have to uh, manage expectations sometimes because uh, some clients uh, are demanding and of course they have a right to be demanding, but we need to manage expectations because um, for instance, Newsday is not going to write about you every single month or every single week or every three weeks or just not. They're on a little bit of a rotation, uh, so to speak. They're uh, very cognizant of who they're writing about. Um, and so uh, um, I think managing expectations is important. And I think the first thing I thought about when we, when we spoke about New York Newsday, uh, you'll remember this, Jody, in 2008, when we had um, the, uh, I think they refer to it as the panic of uh, 2008. Um, what was happening was that large iconic publications around the United States we're closing. So you may recall this Twitter account called the media is dying. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. And yep. so I got kind of like a sick, um, uh, attachment to checking that feed every day because, uh, you would see, I think it was like the, Rocky Mountain News, I think, went online. Uh, I think Newark Star Ledger is now online. Um, um, 
And so it was a shock at the time because remember in 2008, if you got an online hit for a client, they almost immediately said, yeah, 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 but it's, it's only online, right? Right, only right. On- every and somewhere, time. Right, so somewhere about five years ago, maybe. But is it in print? Right, right. Why isn't it in print? Right. Right. So, but now, you know, and this is another thing. So not only there should be a, a, a Twitter account called the media is changing because now we see, so even a News 12 has a Facebook page, has an Instagram account, has a Twitter account, um, is using video, um, uh, has now reports, especially in this pandemic, has reporters going out and say, here, we'll do a FaceTime uh, interview with, with your client. Because that now they needed con- they needed content really badly, so that's it's come it's come all the way into being an absolute vehicle for the news now to to uh, uh, to do their reporting, and then they can they can broadcast the FaceTime live recording that they did with um, uh, your client or organization. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it really is amazing how the technology, the use of the technology. Um, the platforms like the social, the website, how they're they're all intertwined um, and they kind of feed each other and feed off of each other. Um, and, and to the point to use your analogy or, or what we talked about before about, you know, well, why why isn't it in print? You know, th- there are some cases where you may reach more people being on the local media channels, Instagram feed than Correct. you will actually being on their air product. Correct. Yeah. And, and so. It, it, be, it becomes all the more important, I think, what, when we're doing our job as PR people to be thinking about that, to be thinking about, OK, what's the story on TV? What's the story in print? What's the story on social? And, and delivering those elements that the outlets are going to need to say, oh, we can do that there. Oh, we here we can put this on Facebook and here we can put this on TV and here we can put this on the website. And, and, and maybe sometimes it's a combination of all of them. But the point is to, to give them that. So you can avail yourself of, of those of those outlets. Um, you yeah. talked about the media is dying Twitter feed. And I remember that Twitter feed. Uh, you know, traditional media has um, I, I won't use the phrase dying, but man, it has just been on its knees the last 10 plus years in terms of. And I, I started out my first job was in a, in a New York City radio newsroom. So I'm, I'm a reporter before I'm anything else, quite frankly. Yeah, we should, um, we should, and, we should, and we need to come back to that. Yeah, uh, and 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 so so there are challenges that we have in doing our job, getting our clients the publicity and the press that they want to get, simply by virtue of the fact that there are fewer reporters, fewer outlets, fewer opportunities. How do you navigate that with what well, with the media and with the clients? I mean, how how do you figure it out? Well, I think that. Probably what makes you an outstanding public relations professional, in my opinion, is that you know how to think like a reporter because you were a reporter. So when you and this is something we try to constantly teach our team, they they know this now, you have to and then you can, by the same token, communicate this to a client. We just can't call up Newsday and go, hey, you know, um, Bob's Country Store is really good. You know, they're really good, you know. <laughs> that doesn't play. <laughs> be, that, be that pause. And, you know, the Newsday person or the News 12 person will go, uh, Jody, uh, Steve, you know better than that. Um, give me something to work with, right? So, um, which is, has, has happened to me. I was just going to say it's never happened to me. Sometimes it happens, right? You just you just, you're 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 in the weeds. You're just trying to get a story out, and you'll get you'll get gently spanked by somebody you've worked with for a long time. Go, Steve, give me something to work with, you know. Right. So that's <laughs> one of your great talents is that you're trained as a reporter. So you probably don't get spanked, but um, the thing oh, that come it, on, we all do. We yeah, all it's do. true. It's <laughs> true. But when but when we get our clients to think like that, uh, they help us help them. Um, but that's probably if there's another takeaway uh, from this conversation, it's always think like a reporter, because why would I write that story? That story has no worth. 
who and you know you can always figure out who you're writing it for but why would i write it you know if there's some news element to it then it might be better for you know one particular uh, uh, outlet than another or, or or form of media than another but generally you can find a, a different voice um uh you can find the right voice with the same story just adjust the voice a little bit yeah i, I sometimes explain it to clients uh in this way this is important to you you've got to explain why it's important to them yeah that's great yeah you've got you've got to you got to understand that they're doing a job and it's not even important to the reporter as as much as it's important to the reporter's audience correct you know think of when you pick up the publication you want to be in why do you find it interesting? Why do you go to that publication in the first place? Put now, now figure out how you tell your story. That's correct. Um, it's, and it can be an interesting, you talk about managing expectations, it can be an interesting conversation with clients. Well, yeah, I mean. Um, um, like some of them just don't get it. They're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, they, well, or they refuse to get it. They refuse to get it. You guys love it. this. One, this, is, this is a number. This is probably 20 years ago. So a client we'd work with, we, we just killed it for this client. We got so much press for this client. They actually had a wall. This is a restaurant client. Had a wall in their restaurant with our press clippings all over the wall, right? So the woman comes over to talk about the next year and... Uh, you know, she goes, you know, it was just such a dizzy year. Could you just 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 walk me through everything that you guys do for us, right? So I spent a good hour. I tell her every because you know I can talk, right? So I'm telling her all the stuff we do, how we do it. And she sits there and she says to me, I still don't get what you guys do. <laughs> so uh <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, so, um, but she remained a client for a long, long time, but uh, she goes, but yeah, she might have even said, but that's okay, just keep doing what you've been doing, you know, and I just told her how we did it, what we do, and she still didn't get it. So there's that that you may run into from time to time. But you know what, that's not so bad, at least, at least she admitted that she didn't understand it, but she, but she also admitted that she liked what you were doing. Oh, yeah, no question. Right? That's it was working. So. Great. So that. that's good because you run into some people who they don't get it and therefore they go, I don't need you. Right. <laughs> right. Um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, yeah. As we round out this conversation, let's talk a little bit about your industry. You know, yours has got to be and I'll use the word volatile. Right. There are so many restaurants that open and close in a season. Um, it's it's huge turnover. Um, and somehow you have figured out to navigate the industry and to make a business out of it and help people make their businesses successful. What are some of the things um, that go into figuring out how to tell a, a client's story to ramp up very quickly, you know, cause restaurants, a couple of weeks they open, you know, and you gotta have butts and seats right away, first night, right? How do, you, how do you ramp up so fast? How do you get into the weeds with the client, tell the story and make sure that you get them up to running speed real fast? Well, you got to do a lot at once. Certainly, you've got to get all the different marketing channels uh, uh, ready to go and looking right. So that means a quick analysis. If there's an existing Facebook page or Instagram account, cleaning it up or making it right. Uh, are they doing email marketing? Um, um, if not, why not? Do they have the list? Who's managing the list? What's the voice of that e-blast? So you got to take a look at those other channels. But, um, you know, Nothing sells uh, faster or, if you will, easier than news, right? So new equals news is something I've never, ever forgotten. And so that is an aid to the PR uh, professional. Um, so what oftentimes we tell a restaurant is, is that, um, you know, you're, you've got your honeymoon period in this, this, this first three to six months. After six months... It's the next phase, which is making the restaurant an institution. This is also applicable for any other client that you get that is a, that is a new business. That is if it's a, uh, uh, a, 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 a B2C uh, entity, a, a business that is marketing to consumers. I think the thing that really helped me was that I, I speak restaurant. I came out of the restaurant business. So I end up just talking shop when I go in uh, to visit a prospective client. 
um, and they immediately uh, see that I'm not just another vendor, uh, that I actually know what I'm talking about because I've worked for a good 15, 17 years in restaurants, in kitchens, on the floor, as a maitre d', as a bartender, um, so that, um, you know, I speak a little vernacular and I still have it. And a lot of my friends are restaurateurs and chefs. So um, I think that was the, um, the, the, the thing that gave me authenticity. Um, and then we had results, you know, we had the, arguably the, the most desirable client from the start, at least out here in the East End, um, with Nick and Tony's and, and they were gracious enough to say, sure, go ahead, go ahead, you can work other restaurants. I didn't have to have an exclusive with them. So that really helped. And sometimes we do grant exclusives and sometimes you want to be, depending on the industry that you're in, um, you, uh, you, you, you honor, you honor your client by, uh, not, um, representing other, other, other folks. But, uh, I think that was our big advantage that I came out of the restaurant industry. So you mentioned, uh, you know, the period that we're in with COVID-19, the impact that it's had on the restaurant and food industry, really, really challenging times. You know, where, where do restaurants go from here? How do you see them coming back or what do you see as sort of the next phase of their existence? You want to stay visible. So you want to really implore clients to stay visible and to be visible. Because the, um, the data suggests that those companies that stayed visible across, across industries during the 2008 recession, and by the way, we may have another recession coming, right? If we're not in one right now, or we, I think we just went through one. I'm not really sure what the heck's going on, right? <laughs> Nobody is. But um, you, you. But it's only Friday, so. I know, I know. <laughs> this, is, this is what we were talking before we were on the air. Every day is a new adventure, um, but um, you you have to stay visible. You have to be aggressive, and so you know that might mean. So I, I see a lot of social media pages that have that have gone fallow, probably because they've laid off their their social media person or their their marketing person. And I understand you got to make cuts, but man, well you know what Bill Gates says. He says if he says uh, if I owned a or he says he says if, um, he says I would I I would spend my last dollar on public relations. So if there was one piece of advice that you had to give to um, some, a client, right? Or somebody who wanted to start to leverage PR, you know, they think they want to use PR in some way, whether they have an understanding of what it is or not, irrelevant. What, how do you talk to someone who wants to start to dip their toe into, hey, I need to be in the newspaper. Hey, I want to be on the TV news. Hey, I want to use some social media. What's that, what is that piece of advice you ask them to, or you would give them? To be committed to it, to have somebody, if it's not going to be yourself, be a liaison uh, with us or with your, have a liaison to your PR person because the PR person just can't cook stuff up. They need to know um, uh, what's happening at either the restaurant or the business? Are there promotions that, that you're doing that we don't know about? Are you advertising in Newsday and you haven't told us or in, a, um, uh, you know, Woodbury Magazine and you, you, you haven't told us of that because we can help leverage that? Or you, do you have a radio buy whereby we could uh, send some samples over of, uh, of, of you know, uh, pocketbooks or... Um, uh, you know, good chocolate chip cookies from Katie. Um, so uh, to, to get them to really partner and not to just treat a PR firm or a publicist as a, as, as, as a vendor, but to treat them as a, as a, as a partner. And that's when, when, when that, uh, uh, when that occurs, it generally uh, uh, spells success uh, for for the client and then therefore for the PR firm or the publicist. Steve, I really appreciate you spending time with us here. This has been a great conversation. I always learn something when I, when I talk with you. So thank you so much for doing this. Let everybody know how they can find you uh, online. Oh, sure. Well, the website is uh, wordhampton.com. 
And you can find me um, on Instagram uh, at Hawili, H-A-W-E-E-L-I. We also have uh, WordHampton uh, underscore PR on Instagram. And you can find me on Facebook. And I'd, I'd love to meet with you and talk. Any friend of Jody's a friend of mine. And Jody, I may have to come up with a podcast just to reverse the tables and just pick your brain because I, I really... I've always admired, you know, we've, we've, as you know, we have a mutual admiration society with each other. And uh, I think it's, uh, you know, on my end, it's, it's well-founded. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, one of these days, we're going to end up in Southern Maine together, and that'll be fun, you know. So we'll meet at Bob's Clam Hut. I, I will meet you there, and I will buy you some clams. <laughs> yeah, you're a good man. You're a good <laughs> All man. right. Well, thanks again, Steve, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform and spread the word. Let people know what we're talking about. We'll see you next time on the PR Podcast.